So uh, we're going to talk about my course. We're going to talk about how to bring some audio into your um, course. And, and so that we'll talk about what training is necessary, what training is nice, and some of the ways that um, you can bring to assignment types and some of the resources that you have to bring into your class. Um, and then I'll also ask you, so some of you have experience with this, and I'd love to hear about your insights. So um, throughout the the talk, if there's anything that strikes you right away, feel free to unmute or put that in the chat, and then I'll definitely leave some space for that. So think it over as well if you want to share it later. And then I have a few uh, student reflections on just what being part of the course has been like. So first of all, I want to just ask, um, why podcast? Why audio? What, what are some of the reasons that you're interested in this? And um, like, what what's your experience with bringing it into your classroom? So if anybody wants to put those into the chat or just unmute, uh, that's fine too. All right, so we have a comment from Will. Uh, podcasts have become a way of scholarly dissemination. So yeah, knowledge transfer, getting uh, your uh, finding a new uh, way of sharing your research. A few of the things that I wanted to highlight, um, first of all, it's a way of reaching beyond your class and your school. Uh, so especially for students, I feel like they write papers that barely anyone reads, like their instructor reads them, maybe a TA, and then there's no other home for them, there's no other audience for them. And so this is a way of creating work that is that can easily be shared and that can find a, another audience. Um, it's a great way of creating an open education resource, so if you're trying to create something that can be shared freely and, and used in other contexts, then um, it, it works for that. Um, as Will mentioned, um, it's a way for schol scholarly dissemination, so repurposing your research. Um, you've, you've, you've got research that isn't necessarily uh, meant for the uh, a general audience, but you can take that, synthesize it, and turn it into something that can be, um, that can be shared for, for a whole new audience. So we've got a, a, a comment from Sam. Uh, for a project we are creating in CTLT Indigenous Initiatives, we have started a podcast to accompany our in relation project. So we are looking for ways to further podcasting into the teaching and facilitation modules. Excellent. So uh, it's another uh, medium to, uh, to, to work on engaging people. Um, it's also for students, I think it's it's satisfying and, and can be fun to make stuff. I don't know if all of my students are feeling that quite right now as they're like in the grind at the end of the term, but it, it can be uh, uh, like a to have that kind of tangible product that you uh, you, you have at the end of a, an assignment is, is uh, quite satisfying for some. And it's also a creative outlet. So um, in the sciences, I think students sometimes feel like they have to like tamp down their creative drive, their creative um, expression. They aren't able to to um, to pursue that in 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 a lot of their coursework, and so this is a chance for that other side of uh, of their lives uh, to come into play. We can talk a bit about well the copyright aspects and the assignment type um, later on, but um, and, and then we'll talk about student uh, response to these kind of assignments and how um, yeah it does seem like it. it 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 it, um, it uh, catches them in a different way than other assignment types, um, and I I didn't ever consider that <laughs> not having to read a big stack of papers and being able to listen to them while you move around is uh, uh, like another advantage of audio assignments from an instructor pr perspective. Um, so we have another comment: students report sharing audio projects on social media or with families, which has never happened with an essay assignment in my experience, and that's true. I have a photo of a student later who, um, well, I'll save that anecdote for later, but uh, there, there, <laughs> it comes up uh, uh, later on in, in the presentation. So thanks for that, Tammy. All right, <clears throat> so getting into LFS 400 itself, uh, this is a picture from a few years ago of the listening party that we have at the end of the year, um, and so we 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 book the boardroom at um, uh, in our building in McMillan in Land and Food Systems, and um, we get food and other things, and we all listen to it um, as a group. So it's a a nice experience. And that um, in the corner is Will Valley. So Andrew Reisman co-developed the course with uh, Catherine Gatzinger, who's a prof at. Um, uh, the School of Journalism. And after a few years, Andrew uh, moved on and Will took over. And now I'm on to my third co-instructor, who's uh, Julie Carrillo. And they're all, all three of them are subject matter experts within Faculty of Land and Food Systems. And I'm the techie storytelling, uh, you like audio person. So that's kind of the balance that we found for the course. 
Um, so yeah, it's been around for quite a while, since 2006. It started out as a project with the School of Journalism. And um, it was uh, so a partnership with them for a couple of years, and then that sort of fizzled out. But Catherine Gretzinger was on the course for a few years and helped develop the materials. And then in about 2010, she uh, stepped away. And so since then, it's been uh, me and, a, um, and an LFS prof. And so the idea was to bring storytelling skills to LFS students. Um, so land and food systems, agricultural sciences, but also food, nutrition and health students aren't always uh, or haven't haven't been the best at getting the message out about their work. And um, definitely, as we've seen the world change in the last uh, couple of decades, um, the food system and other things have become um, really uh, important topics. And so um, what we see is that we want students to be able to advocate for these causes and to get the, the word out about them. And um, LFS 400 is one of the ways that we, we do that in the faculty. And it also, I mean, at the time, 2006, 2007 podcasting at a at, at universities was really just recording lectures that was like the mode and so what this was doing is taking these tools which were now suddenly very accessible um, and giving it to students rather than just um, just um, repeating old structures of uh, recording lectures and putting them up um, I have another comment here so thank you um, Kritika. Um, this is, as a student, I enjoy uh, getting podcasts as required readings for courses. They break up the flow of only dense, reading dense articles. Also, maybe it's the it's the limited podcast that I have listened to, but they also tend not to have that much jargon, which, which helps. Ha ha ha. Uh, great point. Um, so they can be an accessible or populist way or like popular way of, of looking at some topics. So they can pro provide a nice counterbalance to, um, to heavier academic articles. Um, there are definitely jargony podcasts podcasts out there. I, I've uh, helped out with some of them and <laughs> advised against it, but um, you know, you have to pick your audience. And so sometimes uh, the audience is, is okay with jargon, but um, yeah, I think for the most part, it's a very accessible medium and, and that's one of its real benefits for students. Um, so when we get into the course, um, we have a number of activities that we do within the class. So we have the standard lectures. So I give lectures and we'll talk a bit about some of those on the next slide, but we also have listening sessions. So we try to listen to every to each student's work uh, as they submit assignments throughout the term. So we, we listen to their work. Um, each student pitches their ideas. Um, and so uh, before each assignment, there's time for them to uh, pitch their idea, talk it through with their um, fellow students and with the, the instructors. And then that yields uh, workshopping and feedback um, as we, we work through those ideas. And deeper into the term, when the, the assignments get bigger, um, we do more and more of that to, to help students really refine uh, their work. We do technical help in class, so um, I'll talk about that a bit when I talk about challenges, but getting students to try a whole new mode of, of working and, and tools with which to do that it can be very challenging. So some are more adept at others, and so we want to make sure there's technical help to bring everyone um, uh, along. Um, we have a midterm potluck, so to fit the kind of... Um, slightly more informal nature of the course. We have a potluck and to, there's lots of students that aren't from LFS uh, that end up in the course. And so we want them to uh, be welcomed into the LFS style of, of uh, socializing. Um, we have a couple of field trips that we run uh, throughout the term. So we just uh, did our sound walk uh, the other day, which is kind of active listening. We um, take a walk around campus and um, there's a series of prompts as you, uh, as you walk through campus. Um, and then we also do a tour of CITR radio. We also buy memberships for students um, uh, as a part of course fees. So um, we get some funding uh, to provide the course and those go to guest lecture gifts and a bit of for catering but then we also cover the cost of students to become uh, members at CITR radio and then after the the midterm break we really shift from a seminar to directed study like it's really focused on getting that 12 minute um, documentary audio documentary um, done and we we don't really have as many formal lectures anymore uh, we have some guest lectures to kind of just you know help um, uh, help people along and so typically we have guest lectures every term on media relations so we bring in people that are media specialists to kind of get a sense of what the other side is when you're a, you know 
working as a citizen journalist or, or as a storyteller. Uh, we bring in someone who's a science journalism specialist, and then we also bring in radio and podcast practitioners. So um, that's a pr picture of Chris Oakey from uh, the CBC, who uh, has worked on podcasts there. And we've had um, podcasters from uh, This American Life and also from um, uh, Crackdown, which is a, a, an amazing local podcast. Um, so we've been very... Uh, lucky in that regard to be able to have some of those great voices come into our, our class. Um, so the workshops that we give, uh, um, we start with audio editing. That's something that we want to instill right at the top so that they get comfortable with using um, Audacity, which is the, the program that we recommend. Um, then we start getting them to think about story structure. And again, a lot of these it's a very different mode of thinking uh, about sharing scholarly work um, to to use narrative structure um, to really simple down simplify their writing for the script that they're going to perform. Um, we talk about copyright and creative commons, and so uh, Antje mentioned this um, as being an issue with the the assignments that she has and what to do with them. Um, for this course, we really try to. Um, encourage people to um, make their uh, their work available under Creative Commons, which then allows us to share it on a website that we have. Um, and conversely, then we try to make sure they're only using copyright uh, Creative Commons licensed materials. Um, there is some back and forth around fair dealing for news clips and some other clips that they use, but for the most part, the music and sound effects they're using are all cleared so that we're able to share them freely and not worry about takedown notices or, or worse. Um, we also try to get them to really think about sound. Um, I think when people first get into podcasting, um, they're really focused on like the script or maybe an interview, and then music comes after that. And then building that world of sound is kind of the last thing that that happens for most people. And so um, the uh, we try to get them just inspired to think about how they can create a sense of uh, place with their pieces. And so up top is uh, a sound walk that we took to the UBC farm last year, and we had some specialized gear that we have um, to get them to hear the bees that are down there. Those are beehives that they're pointing their microphones at. Um, and then scripting is really important. So it is a very different mode of, of writing. Students are accustomed to, um, I think, bulking and padding their um, essays as much as possible to kind of, you know, flex or to kind of make it <laughs> sound, to make them sound uh, as smart as they can. Um, and when it comes to scripting, you really have to simplify and it kind of goes against, I think, the, the, um, the mode that students are used to. We also cover journalism ethics, information literacy, which has become a much more complicated topic over the last few years, and then um, making media accessible. And that's a new um, uh, workshop that we're giving this year um, after uh, um, Julie and I, my co-instructor, um, received a Universal Design for Learning Fellowship last year. So we made a, a few adjustments to the course to try to make it more um, accessible and to just um, to kind of follow some of those UDL principles. Um, and if you're interested more in that, I'd, I'd encourage you to look up the UBC UDL hub. Uh, there's lots of information about that program. All right, so again, we have the whole term to work with. So the assignments that we're doing are um, based on that idea that we're kind of scaffolding learning or building up uh, skill sets throughout the term. And this won't be a luxury that um, you have if your assignment is just part of uh, a, a suite of assignments that your your that you, your students are going to be taking care of. Um, but we try to add, think of like what are the kind of projects that gets students using the technology effectively, um, both during the course and then afterwards. What are some skills that we can uh, impart? Uh, them with that they can take out of out of the course. So the first thing that we get them to do is called a streeter or a vox pop. This has become a mode that's very popular on TikTok. I think people, uh, students now understand this as something to do, which uh, wasn't the case a few years ago, but just like walking up to people on the street and asking them about a certain topic. So, you know, a long time ago, that was a very common uh, tactic in um, in news reporting and then you know the onion has spoofed that style if you know that um, satirical newspaper and then now you see a lot of these like pe person on the street interviews so we do this for two reasons one is it's um like pretty low stakes so if your um if your recorder breaks or like or doesn't work properly and you need to get 
um, you need to re-record, you can always go out and find more strangers. You can go back out and you haven't blown that really important interview you have with that prof that's super busy that took forever to schedule. Um, and also it kind of is like an icebreaker, like I think for a lot of us, like the idea of just going up to someone in the street and asking them for their, like to, to talk to them is, is a bit nerve wracking. And so this is like just make, making them like take that, take that leap into this world of audio storytelling and to, uh, and to get into that. Next up is uh, a voicer, which is a two minute story that focuses on one or maybe two people. And uh, this is like a, a news report that you'd hear on the radio. So now they're starting to think about using narration, about using um, interview clips, um, about using music and sound. Then we have a soundscape project. So those are due on Wednesday in my class. And um, oh, we have an outline first. Sorry. Um, the outline is basically just uh, getting students to think about how they're going to tell their story ahead of time. So we get them to work on that over the reading break and then um, it's due kind of right after reading break. So halfway through the term, um, they're, they need to kind of have a plan for how they're going to achieve their final podcast, which is a, a 10 to 12 minute story. And so they're sharing their research links, they're sharing the people that they're hoping to talk to, or they're kind of outlining who would be the, the ideal people to talk to, and having a, a rough kind of layout of the storyboard or the, the narrative structure that they're hoping for. Then we go to soundscapes, which is um, a way of getting them to think about how to record sound. Um, this you know just because something you record something doesn't mean the listener is going to be able to hear that for what it is so it's important to have like a, a really discerning ear when like is that going to sound like a frying pan to someone who isn't there in the kitchen with you it's not always the case so you need to be really um purposeful when you're you're recording sound and putting those into your pieces two weeks before the last uh class we have a draft presentation so Students are sharing like the the working copy of their podcast, and they lay out their their narrative, and then they have time to make some adjustments if they need to. And then on the last um, last day of classes, we have a listening party, and we listen to the final podcasts, and that's um, always a, a celebration. Um, New to this term, we have uh, a transcript uh, assignment that accompanies the final podcast. We used to have that as a bonus, um, like a 1% bonus if you included a transcript, but we realized that it's really important to have that there for accessibility and also um, it's, it's uh, great for people hoping to search the podcast. It's just a really great resource to accompany um, the, the, the audio. So we have that as a, a mandatory assignment now and then we have a reflection assignment at the that's two weeks after um, the last class um, and so we have a series of prompts and for that reflection we allow them to go outside of audio it has to be some sort of digital media but it doesn't have to be um, audio it can be video it can be a comic and can be um, all sorts of other things um, I still remember my first sound safe <laughs> assignment, says Donna, completely changed the way I think about sound. Oh, that's a lovely remembrance. Nice. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I think I'm going to skip this, but um, there's a, a series of clips on the website itself uh, where you can listen to uh, uh, some of the, the student works. But this was a, a streeter that was done by the student um, and uh, Afton Halloran um, about Thank a Farmer Day. But I'm going to skip it just so we can uh, have, leave time for discussion. So these are some of the topics that our students come up with um, for for their work. And so this is just a sound cloud or a, sorry, a tag cloud of uh, the way that they, their stories have been tagged. So you can see things like agriculture, animal welfare, food heritage and food security really um, jump out. A lot of students want to tell student stories. And so they interview fe their fellow students or they, they find someone on campus that can speak to them. Um, urban farming is a big topic. Um, and then when you look at the smaller uh, tags, you can see some of the nuance that, that comes into these stories. All right, so how do we grade these things? Um, so this is the general rubric that we use for all of our audio pieces. Um, and um, this has been refined over the years, um, but this is the one that, that we, we, this is the most recent one. I don't know how well, uh, can you see it okay? Yeah, um, I can share this with everyone afterwards as well, if you're interested, because I know in the past a few people have asked for it. Um, but we break it down into four different sections. 
Um, so we have host or student audio narration. Um, we have the structure, we have audio engineering, and then we have engagement content. And then we break it down, um, in, you know, various degrees from there. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely different ways of doing it, but we found that this is the nice, or like the best balance between the different elements that we're hoping um, students will will um, focus on. Um, I'll include these later, but or I, I can share again share these later. But this is for the outline. Um, we focus on subject matter. Um, that's the he most heavily weighted uh, section. So, you know, especially with the outline, we want to make sure that that's like rock solid. Is that the subject matter is there? That they've got the research and they've they've um, they've they've really got a, a good foundation for the story that they're going to tell. Then the story plan is there. So we want even early on before they've spoken to anyone, we want them to start thinking about what the narrative could be. Um, because that can be very tricky for people after they've interviewed a bunch of people. If they don't have that kind of focus worked out, um, they just end up with a bunch of somewhat related interviews and then trying to craft a storyline out of that afterwards is, is a real chore. Um, and then the contacts or the interviewees or the subject uh, or the, um, the, the um, characters of their story. So um, we wanna make sure that the people that they've sought to interview are um, appropriate and also that they're going to be achievable. Um, so, you know, sometimes people are pretty ambitious with who they wanna to talk to, which I think is great, but uh, it's always important to have a plan B when, you know, that, that person isn't available. And then uh, this is brand new. So this is, uh, developed by uh, the teaching assistant this term. We have a TA for the first year. And uh, so Melissa Platsko is a grad student um, and she developed this uh, transcript transcript rubric. Um, so this is what we're how we're gonna be grading that new assignment that we have. And so we went for grammar and spelling, clear and accurate formatting, a complete record, and then timestamps. And um, um, yeah, we looked at examples from radio shows like This American Life and um, there's a couple of other uh, big American public radio podcasts that have um, great uh, transcripts and so we're, we're, we've worked it out from there, some suggestions for students. Um, also, I mean, it's a kind of a uh, nebulous territory, but there's a lot of web services now that will do transcription that makes it like a much different ask of students. Um, so if they're comfortable uploading their audio to American servers and having robots transcribe it, then uh, it can be done very easily compared to the old fashioned way, which, um, you know, I had to do way back when and I, it was like just torture for me to transcribe uh, manually. But um, yeah, um, we haven't, uh, as a course, like paid for one of those services yet to cover for students. And for the most part, there's some free, um, like there's like free plans where you get a certain amount of space per month. So we're kind of relying on that for now, but it's something to revisit in the future, especially as we're um, asking students to provide these transcripts. Um, so some of the challenges uh, of a course like this, um, definitely uh, getting students to adopt a new way of working can be very challenging. And so that, that there's many different um, uh, parts to that. So one is just media creation. So um, thinking of, uh, for a lot of students, I think it's um, a bit overwhelming to start to use an audio editor to think about audio. Um, and so um, getting them to, like just making sure that they are feeling supported with that um, is really big. Also, some students really struggle to um, like kind of break through and like do the cold call, reach out to people when they need to. They're just kind of reluctant to do that. And so again, like practicing interviews, doing things to support them in um, being a bit more um, extroverted or like uh, or, or going out there uh, out of their comfort zone a bit is um, is really important. And then also, th this isn't a course where you can um, like pull an all nighter and write a paper and just submit it at the end for better or for worse. I mean, I have definitely done that in my life. So I'm very sympathetic to how those things can happen, but you can't like conjure up interviews with people and edit them together and make a 10 minute um, audio documentary um, at the last minute. And so there, yeah, I, you, sometimes there are, are some, um, 
some challenges around that. And that's part of why we've structured it with these like smaller assignments first to build up skills. And then we have that, that draft two weeks out to try and make sure like when you hear everyone else in the class is kind of at this level and uh, you're not quite there yet, then hopefully it's a wake up call and can help people um, get that work done over that, that, those last two weeks. Um, we also have like, I bring out a big board um, at this time of year and just with a check checklist of everything that needs to be done for your final podcast. And uh, I put up uh, like to do, doing and done. And um, it's anonymous, but I get everyone in the class to mark where they're at on each of those tasks. And it's just to, to give students a sense of where they're at relative to their peers. And hopefully um, it can be a bit of a wake up call if people are, feel like they're, they're falling behind. Um, administrative support can be a real challenge. Thankfully, we've gotten amazing support for this course. Um, there were some pretty lean years in the like the pre serial podcast days. Uh, <laughs> podcasting wasn't as cool as it is now. And so there were times where the course um, had only uh, like six, six students in it. Um, so thankfully, we, we uh, uh, the uh, powers that be at Land and Food System stuck with it. And my old boss, um, Cyprian Lomas was a big part of that. Um, and now the course is, uh, you know, the full, it fills up every year and, and is in a very healthy shape. Um, but getting something this experimental and, and this kind of out of the norm started would be a challenge. And then there's also just the, the cost of, of gear and other things that um, we have to support students. So on the one hand, a lot of this can all be done with phones now and um, people are able to edit um, on their laptops. Um, but we have tried to build up um, some other gear that we can um, do to support. So we all, we have um, audio recorders, we have these field kits for um, for sound recording. And then we also have a, a pop-up podcast studio that we set up for the term um, in one of our spaces. Um, this picture is uh, very early in the course when we didn't have any of that kind of equipment um, at UBC. And so our the co-instructor, Catherine Gretzinger, would book out a studio at the CBC. And so we were able to go to the CBC <laughs> to do a uh, recording, which was very nice. And that student, um, I am blanking on her name right now, but um, she was a soil studies student, um, which is like some like one of the more misunderstood uh, fields of study at UBC potentially. Um, and she said that her parents had never really understood why she was studying dirt <laughs> is the way that they put it. Um, and she was able to tell this beautiful story about soil and soil studies. And uh, she said it was the first time that her parents really understood why she was studying it. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was very rewarding uh, to hear that, that like this kind of storytelling had really helped um, break through and, and, um, and, and, and had been something really Really wonderful to share with her family. Okay, so that's all been very nice. This is uh, a whole term. You get to luxuriate in the world of audio. What happens when you don't have a whole term? You're just trying to have this as be one assignment uh, amongst many, and you have many other competing interests within your course. Okay, so these are a few things that I would recommend if you are trying to bring in an audio assignment. So there are some must-have workshops. I don't think you can really do this. Um, without uh, these workshops. So you need to have something around audio recording. So this could be 20 minutes to half an hour, but you just need to help students figure out how to record on their phone, figure out technique. If they're gonna interview someone else, they really need some help in like, can't just put the phone on the uh, in the middle of the, um, the table. Don't go to a coffee shop to record. Here's how you record over Zoom. All these things are going to make it much easier for you as someone who has to listen to these and grade them. And also just make sure that it's something that students are a bit more proud of. Um, and so like I say, I mean, most students have smartphones. They have um, gear that can do a really good job of recording. Um, you can't monitor a smartphone really as far as I know, which means you can't listen along. So um, there are some hiccups with that. But for the most part, um, you just need to let uh, give students some support in how to record uh, the, their pieces. Then audio editing and file management. So 
Um, <laughs> it's a whole trick to get a uh, recording off of a phone onto a laptop and then uh, figure out how to make uh, adjustments to that and ideally bring in maybe some music or sound effects. So getting some support in that. Um, I recommend Audacity. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward program. It's cross-platform, so you can use it on a Mac or a PC. And it's also something that students can use after they leave the university. So they haven't like learned on this really fancy editing program and then they're going to have to pay a monthly subscription to use it afterwards, which they may not do. It's a tool that they can continue using. I've also heard great things about a, a program called Reaper that apparently has like an unlimited free trial. You can just like re-up your free trial. Um, I haven't uh, used it, so I, I can't say, but I know other people that have that, that uh, whose opinion uh, I, I respect. Um, and then beyond there, there's lots of other um, ways of editing, but um, those are the two that I think for undergraduates on a budget, that's uh, a good approach. Um, and then in terms of file management, just like how to make sure that you're um, sharing an MP3 if you have to convert anything. And then, yeah, it's just good to know a little bit about um, compression with mp3s these kinds of things and if you have any questions about these things i i can help you out and um i have some slides that i can share i've, I've given this workshop uh to a number of different courses uh, not just uh, my own course so i can help out with that and then a bit about copyright and creative commons if you're hoping to share these more widely so Antje mentioned that for her course um the students are grabbing movie clips and using them in the podcast and that's probably okay there's kind of like a uh, limbo around like using uh, copyrighted material for review purposes. And so I think if you did want to like check out, well, ask Donna or someone else from uh, the library, you could get like some advice on that. Um, but students often want to use music that is copyrighted, other sounds that are copyrighted. And it's just good to give them a sense of what um, uh, of what they're allowed to do um, if they're going to put that publicly. And also you want to make sure that they're informed if they're going to um, put a Creative Commons license on their work. Um, you want to make sure that they're really uh, clear with what, what's going to happen if you you put the, the work online. Um, one thing that I've noticed is I now make sure to even though I get permission to, to share the work, I ask them how they want to be, like what name they, or like how they want to be identified um, when they're sharing it. Because a few times um, students have gone on to other things and still like the number one hit on Google because of the institutional power of UBC and because it's been up there for a while is the student podcast that they did. And some people are very proud of that and that's great. And other people are like, eh, I don't need anyone to know about this when I'm applying for a job. And so, um, some students now just use their first name or they, they use their initials and that's totally fine. There's like a, okay. Um, and so I would always check on that kind of thing before you, you post things online. All right. So some nice to have workshops, um, scripting, writing for the ear, like I mentioned before, students are like, if you're in essay mode, it's really hard to break out of that. And you have run on sentences and you have, jargon or other like really like long words that sound impressive on the page but are don't sound impressive when you're trying to listen to them or when students are trying to perform it so um talking to them about writing for the ear simplifying their language realizing that it's a different mode and you don't have to put all those really big words in there and you need to break up your sentences so that um, you'll be able to read it and people will be able to hear it. Um, performing as well, um, for the sake of your uh, <laughs> listening pleasure, um, giving students some tips on how to project their voice, some things that they can do to sound their best is really helpful. Um, many of you probably have uh, experience with interviewing, um, but students can be very new to that and it can be a pretty overwhelming thing to go out into the world and and talk to people so uh giving them some interview tips and and um yeah especially if you're interviewing someone for discovery and you're hoping to get like great tape um sounding trying to sound smart in the interview to impress someone can really derail your interview because you end up with just like this conversation between two experts in a field where what you really want is one person who's asking kind of open-ended simple questions and then someone that's explaining for a general audience typically that's kind of what you want from a, a an interview there may be 
other there there are other kinds of interviews but typically that's kind of what you want and so some some uh, tips for students when they're getting into that uh, storytelling again giving them some idea of like the narrative flourish that they can bring to these stories that will help engage listeners and then like i mentioned before sound um, it's often the last thing that people think about but um, when you hear really nice sound design or like a really well-placed sound effect or some some ambient sound um, it can really lend a, a sense of place and it can be a, a great way to tran transport the, the listener. So when, when used well, um, it can be very effective. So now some of the formats that I've seen people use um, uh, in the various courses that I've helped out with and in, in my own course. So I think, and these are, I've, I've listed these from uh, relatively easiest to hardest. So audio essays are kind of the standard thing when people are thinking about getting students to do um, some kind of audio, they get them to read out an essay and maybe they have some clips for review or they have um, something that they drop in, but it's just uh, a, a read aloud and recorded version of an essay. Um, next, you might move up to a conversation between classmates. And so I think this format is probably familiar to a lot of undergrads who listen to podcasts because this has become the dominant mode of podcast is like two people just uh, shooting the breeze. Um, and so this can be um, kind of an appealing way for them to um, have a, a, an audio assignment in that this is like a form that is uh, familiar to them. Um, you have to remind them that it needs to maintain its rigor, even if they're being a bit more irreverent than they would normally be uh, in their assignments. There's also the streeter or um, vox pop, vox populi person, voice of the street, or uh, voice of the people. Um, so that can be, that was something that um, uh, a prof heard about my course and they brought that into their, their class. And so it was a, to get students to think about um, other people's uh, perception of, of popular topics. And so they did that. Then you have soundscapes or interviews with experts. Um, and then really you're getting into a much uh, trickier territory when you get to audio documentary. So telling those stories with sound, with narration, with multiple interviews, it just becomes uh, a much have like a much heavier load um, for for students to edit those together. It's like by far the most um, I think rewarding when when it when it's done and they they have something that they'd be proud of. But if you're dropping that into the middle of uh, of uh, another course, it could be pretty tricky. And then it's something that I haven't worked on, although I've done a little bit of it in my work at CITR, but um, uh, audio fiction or radio dramas. And so um, I uh, yeah, I mean those can uh, run the gamut. I'm sure that they could take up a lot of work, or they could be kind of uh, <laughs> a little more cast off. But um, yeah, those are some of the ways that I, I thought that uh, some of the formats that people have used uh, in their courses. Anything that I missed? Any other formats or styles that people could think of that might come up into courses? All right. So um, in terms of on-campus uh, resources, so as Donna mentioned, um, the library is an uh, excellent resource. So um, you can uh, reach out to um, either Aaron here at UBC Vancouver or Donna up at UBCO, and that's the Digital Scholarship and Open Education Workshops. And I know that you're doing one on um, Audacity editing in July. Is that correct, Donna? And that's open to both campuses? Yeah, it's virtual and it'll be open to everyone. Wonderful. Great. Um, there's also the DIY media series. So I'm part of something called the Digital Media Community of Practice. And we have a series called the DIY Media Series. And so I run a workshop on podcasting and that's like a, everything you need to know about podcasting in three hours workshop. Um, <laughs> if you think listening to me for an hour is long, wait till you listen to me for three hours. Um, but then there's also sessions on the Adobe Creative Cloud, on um, uh, video production, uh, a, a number of different things. So you can look for that or um, reach out to me if you want um, some more information on that. Uh, the Chapman Learning Commons is uh, a great resource for um, digital media work. Um, up top there in the corner of this slide, you see um, the DIY studio space that they have there. And it's really nice. They have two really nice microphones and it's in this um, great soundproof room. Um, so that is something that they are keen to work with uh, st uh, students or classes 
Um, I know Alex is on leave at the moment, but um, yeah, the the team there is um, is really open to to partnering with classes and having uh, blocks of bookings, um, and they also have audio gear that you can borrow um, to to take out. Um, likewise, uh, UBC Studios has a place. So UBC Studios is a uh, place on campus that um, does video production centrally, and they have a couple of um, of uh, uh, podcast stations there. Um, then uh, your home faculty might have some some gear. It's always there's no centralized list of of all that stuff, but each faculty kind of has their own cache or their own experts, and so it's worth asking around a bit to see if anyone uh, within your faculty might have something. Um, and then lastly, CITR Radio. Um, so that's the campus radio station at UBC Vancouver. That's a picture of me in Studio B uh, for a photo shoot I did there. And um, yeah, they, they uh, we partner, uh, my class partners with them to do some training and also um, to have studio space. And they've partnered with other courses in the past. Um, and they're, they're, they're always keen and uh, uh, um, up for a collaboration. So worth uh, checking in on, on that as well. And then in terms of off-campus resources, uh, the Vancouver Public Library Central Branch has just reopened their Inspiration Lab. So this is a media creation space on the sixth floor, um, including some sound studios, and I know local podcasts that, that record there. Um, there's lots of books about podcasting that um, if you need a, a list, I can, I can recommend a few. But NPR recently published a podcasting guide that's a really great accessible beginner's guide to podcasting. And there's lots of other um, of those resources. And then NPR also publishes a, a training website that is really excellent. So um, the one uh, that I've highlighted here is the Ear Training Guide for Audio Producers, which looks at typical audio issues that people have, how to assess them, and, and then how to remediate them. And then Transom is another place that has a lot of great resources. And that's a uh, an audio institute in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And um, they have a lot of uh, resources that I, I draw upon as well. And then in terms of sound, uh, Free Sound and the Free, Free Music Archive are two uh, websites, web services that have uh, are really well integrated with Creative Commons uh, material. And so I, I often point students there when they're in search of, of sound or music. Um, all right, a little bit about uh, student experience. So um, this was a um, part of the uh, reflection piece that students had. Um, so this one student really wanted to learn about um, illustration. And, and um, so she recreated the audio recorder that we had in Illustrator, despite the fact that she didn't know how to use Illustrator before and it took a really long time for a 10% assignment. But it was a very cool thing that she did and it was a, a kind of a nice um, thing. So um, this is Olivia writes, uh, my creative process is always kind of a mess. I'm all over the place. But since we had flexibility to do things in our own style, I really felt at ease, despite crippling deadline stress. <laughs> and the creative freedom really opened the idea floodgates for all sorts of new projects. And uh, so that was really a nice and kind of a, a, a incredible story. She went on, she did her degree in um, food, nutrition, and health. And after this course kind of got inspired and became a me medical illustrator um, in the faculty of medicine and then went on to do that, uh, a master's in, in um, medical illustration. So um, she hadn't had any experience with illustration beforehand and got really inspired. So um, that, that was really, that was really fun. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just mindful of the time. So I just want to, yeah, I want to leave some time for discussion. So I'll just say we, we have, uh, I went through some of our student experience of instruction or the, the course of ours to kind of highlight some of the things, but um, I'll just cut those out because it's kind of braggy and we have to get like moving, but uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll highlight these two. So this is the first course I had taken at UBC that made me feel more connected to the real world. Coming from a science background, this course actually felt more technical than my lab courses and allowed me to pursue my interest in audio and movie ed editing. And I felt like the amount of time given in class to talking through projects and ideas really set me up for success. All the assignments felt genuinely designed to support learning rather than being hoops to jump through as is so often the case. And the earlier assignments and processes I had to go through um, gave me great practice for the final assignment. That the class is discussion-based and requires a considerable amount of engagement and sharing product outputs from early on really helped build up my confidence and get over the anxiety I had sharing my thoughts and work and looking silly. Um, 
I think I'll feel the impact of this well beyond audio storytelling projects. Okay, so that was really uh, like a very heartening to hear. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, it hasn't all been uh, positive, but those were some of the ones that I wanted to highlight. And they're actually all posted, all of my course evals are posted on the, the course website. So if you do wanna go through those, you're, you're welcome to do that. So yeah, I, I went on a bit long, surprise, surprise, but I wanted to um, just call on anyone here that wanted to share some of the things that, um, kind of went through your mind when you um when, when you brought audio into your course so i know Antje did that uh, tammy has done that as well and um if and andrew as well was uh the co-founder of the course so if you have any anything you want to share about that process um i'd i'd, I'd welcome you the, the the floor is yours yeah well yeah, thanks. So I was, this is fantastic. I was just going to ask a question to you or maybe other people have engaged in these. So early on in your slides, you mentioned you talk about sort of information literacy um, as part of the scaffolding for the projects. And it seems like the the idea of students going out and um, creating a media object and sharing that object really, really must make them engage in the idea of information literacy. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like what sort of scaffolding you do in that area and, and like if you see any outcomes or or um, student impacts specifically around information literacy. Um, well, I think um, so. The, the The information literacy workshop is delivered by Julie Creo, the my my uh, my co instructor, and it's really just about like how do we know what we know, and applying uh, the academic rigor that we have to papers and and um, as scientists, I'm not a scientist, but they do as scientists to uh, the the world more broadly and to media, and so I don't think students. I, I mean, it's been very interesting to. See see um, the media diet of students also change. Uh, whereas, you know, when we started the course, it felt like um, people were listening to the radio and occasionally reading magazines. And um, I felt like I was kind of in the same boat as them. And then slowly, I realized like, some of my references to like the CBC and other things were like, not landing at all, because like students are getting most of their news from social media. And so um, that like, if that I think is the hope is that they they see as these things are put together and you know like the manipulation that can happen with that just it, it makes them more critical of the media that they and the science communication also that they see in the world more broadly. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just read out, uh, or do you want to do you want to share this? Well, sure. I was just going to say, um, Kaltura, you mentioned um, in terms of transcription. So Kaltura, at least instructors can upload audio there, and it'll auto transcribe. Um, it's only in English, so like francophone or like I work in Spanish. Um, it's annoying, but <laughs> yeah, but that's a good um, situation. But yeah, I just to um, say that. I really appreciate that you came to my class and you gave a workshop and um, the incorporating podcast for me, it was, well, for my students, it was amazing for me. It was very good. I, I think I'm too much of a perfectionist. It was a learning curve. Um, and the, the marking took a lot longer for me just cause I wasn't used to it, but um, I definitely want to do it again um, post tenure and um, yeah, be better about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was a great experience. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, transcription through culture is a great um, uh, is is a great suggestion. And yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Duncan. This was fantastic. I feel like I learned a lot. I feel also like like you just nailed a lot of the reasons people are engaging in open pedagogy projects of the you know of getting students sort of out of their comfort zone of of knowing the students when you're when you're taking on new work like this, you kind of rise to the occasion. Um, and, you know, just having people share their work is, is fantastic. I, this was, this was great. So.